Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's virtual plant clinic, the place that if you have any lawn or garden or tropical fruit plants or questions about coconuts or moles or gophers or anything else in between, you can come and ask. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida IFAS Extension Service here in Hernando County, and I'm here with my regular co-host, Lily Browning. Good morning, Lily. Good morning, Bill. I'm just regular. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> the the regular dependable co-host. There you go. Mostly. Except when you have conflicting meetings, which happens to all of us sometimes. Yeah, about every other month or so, yes. <laughs> yeah, my schedule is never ending conflicting anymore, it seems like. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, you were well, just went from one zoom meeting to in-person meeting to another zoom meeting i had you teach a class and i purposefully put your portion last because i knew you were <laughs> that was a good thing i was running about 10 minutes late all uh, yeah you had a time. tight schedule there yes mm -hmm. so. that's okay just went from one thing to another to another all different topics all lawn garden landscape homeowner type things except for the class that I did with Matt Smith on if you have five acres, which we we're having part two of that today at noon, if anybody's interested. But Matt talked about all the different things that you need to keep in mind and know in advance and be thinking about if you wanna start your own small farm, uh, small private nursery, you wanna grow plants and sell them to the public, all the different legalities and insurance and accounting and things like all those boring. And, yeah, um, a lot of people think they just want to do that for the uh, green belt uh, tax relief, whatever you know. Mm -hmm. um, but there are rules for that. Yes, there yeah, are. You can't right? just you can't just decide that. And you know, there are various like even if you have a nursery, it has to be a certain size. You have to be at least. Um, selling stuff i don't know you know not necessarily making money but at least you know and you know they're they're pretty strict about that green belching um exemption they are and that's decided by each county um and you basically have to convince them that you have a legitimate agricultural business or operation yeah. going where you are aiming to make a profit mm -hmm. you don't have to be making a profit yet but it has to, you have to convince them that it's a legitimate operation. So if you let your lawn just go and you say that you, it's a pasture and you're raising hay, they may not go for that. No. <laughs> and there are certain sizes. I said nursery because that's the smallest amount of acreage um, that you can have and have an agricultural enterprise and get the uh, green belt. You know, if you have horses or something, I think you have to have at least five acres or something like that. Well, Hi, buddy. You need, you need at least a couple acres to support a horse or two or three. And I'm not sure how many acres per horse or how many one. acres per cow. It's about an acre per, per horse. So. Per one per um, horse and offspring. Okay. That's what it used to be. And that is actually just good practice, <laughs> too. Exactly. And we're going to be covering that at noon today. Uh, we, Like I said, we do have another free class coming up today called So You Have Five Acres because we get a lot of phone calls from people and people who come by the office and they say, I just moved here and I have one acre or five acres or 10 acres and I want to start a farm or I want to raise horses or I want to raise, you know, have a hay operation or start a small nursery. How do I do it? And that's such a huge open-ended question. There is no short answer for that. So we're putting together a series of free classes looking at different operations that we get questions on and letting people know just where to start. We're, I mean, it's not a really advanced course. It's like we help you make the whole list of things that you need to look into and make phone calls about and check into and read up on before you make that final decision, okay, I'm, I can do this, I'm gonna go for it, or it sounds like too much work or too much mm -hmm. expense. Uh, I really don't like working outdoors all that much, so I'm not gonna go for it. Or I just cool. don't have the time. 
they, you know, they just sometimes don't realize how time intensive it is. Nobody on a small farm, um, nobody on, <clears throat> you know, 100 acres or less is making a living on their farm. <laughs> so you do have to have your other job and then you do have to love what you're doing mm -hmm. as far as farming. Good morning, BJ. Good morning, BJ. How are you? I've been clicking on all the different on all the we have nine yes. people on here watching. I saw Buddy saying hi. He was in our class yesterday. Okay. About bugs. And we decided we only um we could only get a few bugs in in an hour <laughs> yesterday. Hey Teresa. Teresa's and here good morning. So we decided kind of on the spot that we are going to do a part two of bugs that bite sting or taste you and that's going to be march 17th that's a tuesday at um 10 and what were the fun and interesting we were going to cover kind of really gross ones yesterday we did we had karen who did mosquitoes i did bees and wasps bill you did what beetles um oh scorpions uh, fighting flies Scorpions. Yeah. I was going to tell you something yesterday. Yeah. You said, <laughs> morning, Linda. You said, uh, oh, yay, Bernie's there. Yay. <laughs> Everybody, Bernie, the master gardener, is back at the extension office. I think this is his grand opening, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. And let me go ahead and show our office phone number. So if you have a lawn and garden question, please feel free to give us a call because we have Bernie in the uh, lab back there, ready and waiting to answer all of your questions. So okay. if we get any really, really hard ones today, we're just gonna pass them on to Bernie, I think. What I was gonna mention to you in yesterday's class, cause you said scorpions, you've only ever known people way out in the woods who has scorpions. Generally, there's a few cases and I can share those with you where people get a bad scorpion problem, but most people don't have a problem with them. As a Royal Highlander, mm -hmm. as a Highlander, you know, there can be only one. Now, um, as a Royal Highlander, I can tell you we have them here. I have them in my house, uh, you know, kind of on a cycle. So they are, maybe because there is so much building and stuff going on here, and just the type of area that we live in um, have yet to be stung by one, but there are times you got to watch your shoes. And, and as you mentioned yesterday, for those who missed the class, we don't have killer scorpions here. It's not going to poison you to death. Like maybe in Arizona or something, it's going to feel like a wasp sting. It's going to hurt like heck, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that's what I've heard. <laughs> yes. But what we're going to speak on in part two on March 17th are, you slightly covered fire ants. We're going to cover them a little more in depth. Fleas and ticks, lice, bed bugs, and mites. So, we, oh, IO caterpillars. We talked about cat stinging caterpillars yesterday. If yeah, you I look. That specific one, but that's another one that does have the stinging hairs. Mm -hmm. If but, you look on my Facebook page, Hernando FFL program at Facebook, um, you'll see the recording of yesterday's program. Bill had yes. some audio issues. Bill was in a. I don't know where all you were flying off to, but you were in an aircraft carrier <laughs> yesterday giving that class. Hopefully our um, partner at Hernando County Public Information, before it gets on YouTube, will be able to work on that audio issue. Yeah, right. I guess I need to check the microphone settings on Zoom because I have a whole bunch of different microphones technically to pick from, and maybe no. I picked the wrong one. Zoom uh, you, picked the, the um, you picked the tin can one yesterday. <laughs> okay. Well, it's, it's not under that name, but apparently <laughs> it works like a tin can. <laughs> um, so you know what I have noticed? What's that? That, that scorpions spring. fall off the ceiling all the time? Oh, no. I haven't had that happen. <laughs> Although my, I mean, they might have. My husband usually smashes them on the wall when he sees them there, so they don't get to the ceiling. 
Um, he gets a particular joy out of smashing the <laughs> scorpions. I have noticed it's springtime here in Central Florida. Yes, it is. And so many people talk about there are no seasons in Florida. If you're here long enough and you are in touch with nature, you can tell there are seasons. Seasons don't slap you in the face like they do in Ohio or Pennsylvania or New York or Indiana or any place like that. It's subtle, but it's there. And also, you know, Florida, Florida doesn't follow rules. <laughs> so therefore, we're also not going to follow a calendar and say March 21st must be spring or whatever. Nature tells us when it's spring and there's all kinds of little wildflowers popping up. Things budding out. A lot of things that have frozen are coming back. Um, Carpet bees will be coming out very soon. Yes. I even have a passion vine that was in a pot. You know, and of course it froze. And I'm thinking, oh, in a pot, it might not come back. It's coming back. You oh, mine are popping up in the lawn in my backyard because my neighbors have them. And passion vines travel far and wide underground and they will start yeah. popping up in my yard and everybody else's yard eventually. Well, I got it so late. I got it in the fall. I was afraid to take it out of the pot and put it in the ground quite yet. I probably will, you know, maybe this summer when it's good and strong. Um, but um, having saying that it's spring and the fact that I saw it was going to be like 86 on Sunday I am particularly aware of that because I will not be getting my new AC system that I suddenly need until Monday. Um, <laughs> um, it's still, we could have some more cold snaps. It's been in the 40s at night. We could have another freeze or two. It's not out of the realm of possibility. So don't get overly zealous in pruning all your dead material away yet. Got about, about two more weeks really before you should think about that. Yeah, if you could be patient and hold off a little bit longer, it's definitely safer for that. It is a little tricky out in your vegetable garden if you have one. Technically, I would recommend right now is when you want to get certain spring things in. Definitely um, plants that have a lot of insect pest problems and disease problems, things like cucumbers, summer squash. I would technically put my cucumbers in today. Now, I can't guarantee there's not going to be another freeze. You may need to be prepared to cover them or keep them warm if we get another cold night, but there are huge advantages to getting them in early. If you wait, if you've moved here from Pennsylvania and you go out there and you start planting your cucumbers in May, I can almost guarantee you that you will not get any cucumbers, or if you do get cucumbers, they will have caterpillars in them. So with a lot of crops, tomatoes is well. better. But earlier it gets a little sketchy because, you know, none of us can guarantee that the freezes are over with. Right. Is this a good time to start your tomatoes? Oh, yeah. I started tomatoes from seeds a month or so ago, and I have a whole bunch of beautiful transplants. They're all, what would that be, six to eight inches tall? I need to repot them again and pot them up. I'm going to wait until March to actually put them in the ground. But they're doing just great in small containers. Like I said, I need to repot them into bigger pots and keep them growing and get them great and big and healthy. So when I do put them in the ground, they're going to grow quickly. I'm going to get a bunch of tomatoes off of them because they will be done by maybe June 15th. What and kind of people, tomatoes? For people what? from up north, they're thinking, well, my tomatoes are just getting started June 15th. Well, yeah. Ohio, yeah. yeah. Here, they're finishing June 15th. And um, what kind of tomatoes? <laughs> what kind of tomatoes do you use? A uh, couple different kinds of cherry tomatoes: the yellow ones, orange ones, red ones, and green ones, and Roma tomatoes. A nice okay. disease-resistant variety of a nematode-resistant variety of Romas. What do you suggest for those who want to use like the Heritage or the Better Boys? Or yeah. <laughs> They do really well in Pennsylvania, where your <laughs> parents used to grow them. The problem is, 
Well, the good thing is we have two different tomato seasons here in Florida, one in the spring and one in the fall again, but neither one is really, really long. And some of those heirloom tomatoes or the really, really big tomatoes, the huge beefsteak ones, take a long time to grow and flower and fruit and for the fruit to size up out in your garden. And you tend to run out of tomato season before your tomato plants produce a whole lot. So if you do that in the spring, unless you go out and do it really super early and cover and protect your plants, or if you have a hoop house or um, uh, some kind of covering over them, unless you do it really, really early, you're going to put the tomatoes out and June 15th is going to roll around and your tomatoes won't be done getting you tomatoes. And then diseases set in and insects set in and the tomatoes I know people who have kept them going into the summer, but you end up putting a lot of water and a lot of pesticides, a lot of fungicides, a lot of fertilizer on them, and you usually end up not getting a whole lot in return. It's a good experiment in learning what can go wrong with a tomato because it will <laughs> after that time frame. They just don't do well in this heat. Well, no vegetables do well, except like you said, okra, Sweet potato. Black eyed peas. Sorry, black eyed peas. Yes. Yep. I grew them once before and I got a great crop of black eyed peas. They were great. And I grew them in the middle of summer. Yeah. And so if you think about it, what does, if you hear the words okra, black eyed peas, and um, sweet potato, what do you think of? I think of Southern food, oh. <laughs> the South. Duh. <laughs> yeah, that's what grows in the and winter. BJ, BJ in or, I mean, in the summer. Also, eggplant will produce Egg. a little bit later in the summer. So even though, like as a general rule, June 15th, your tomatoes are really going to start to decline after that. They're going to get a lot of disease problems. If you're out there with a the fungicide once a week, you can keep them going a little bit longer. Eggplants will go longer into the summer. Hot peppers can go longer into the summer. And sometimes you can keep a hot pepper plant alive during the summer. It'll start to look a little rough. But if you can kind of baby it and keep it alive during the summer, when the fall comes around and the weather cools off a little bit, it'll perk back up and flower and give you a whole nother flush of hot peppers. Can't I just put my tomatoes in the shade, Bill? No, because the hot sun is only part of the problem. The biggest problem is the weather because in the summer, obviously it gets very hot, but it gets very, very humid all day and all night. And it stays really warm all night and it rains in the late afternoon and it starts to rain at night. Also, those are all perfect conditions for fungi. So all the fungal leaf spots just absolutely love that. And they're going to attack your tomatoes, your cucumbers, a lot of other vegetables, a lot of other landscape plants. We see every kind of hedge bush that people might have in their yards. People will bring in samples, usually around late summer, with the little brown or black spots on them. That's just a fungal leaf spot, and that's almost to be um, expected. You can almost just assume that it's going to be a problem on almost everything, at least a little bit by the end of summer. Well, and define problem. It's, I mean, it's just going to be there. It's not necessarily a problem. Sure. On your, on your hedges, you might get some spotted leaves, but it's not going to be a terminal problem. It's not going to kill your hedge. And that's probably from the rain bouncing up off your house or the ground. You know, it might not even be your irrigation system that caused it. It's the rain that pours off your house. and Sure. And blowing rain, raindrops and water blowing from plant to plant or leaf to leaf is going to spread it, spreads bacterial diseases that way also. Uh, the it, it really is the super high humidity and temperatures that a lot of diseases absolutely love. And that's why there's such a problem in the summer. So in the vegetable garden, the earlier you can get these things in, we do tend to have a time period Sometimes, not always, but for the next month or so where it's relatively low humidity and not a whole lot of rain and sunny and warm, which is perfect for growing tomatoes and peppers and eggplants. Mm -hmm. And I always say those vegetables are smarter than we are. 
I don't want to be out there when it's that hot. <laughs> Neither do they. Because <laughs> I also wilt and get all kind of <laughs> fungal leaf spots or something. Yes, so all those southern food type vegetables are going to do well in the summer. And you know, there's um, a number of different tropical vegetables that you could try experimenting with. Which is, you know, what okra, that's what okra is, right? It's not, you know, it's from Africa originally, yeah, okra isn't it? Is yeah. Going yeah. To tropical Africa. There are different various things that are native to um, South and Central America that you could try growing. Uh, yucca, also known as cassava, grows in the tropics. So it's going to grow just great here all summer long. The heat and humidity don't, don't bother it. Um, what else is there? There's a couple different root crops. Um, boniato, which is a type of sweet potato, I believe. You cook it like sweet potato. Hmm. Um, what about fruits? What about watermelon? Don't they grow late into the year? Watermelons, boy, watermelons have a lot of disease problems. They have a lot of fungal problems and they have a lot of viruses now also that are vectored by white flies. So if you're trying to grow watermelon, get it in really soon and get it in really early and get it up and growing and well watered and fertilized and well cared for so it grows quickly. And try to get your watermelon harvest in as early as you can. Because the longer into summer that the, you try keeping the vines and the vines go, the more problems you're going to have. Commercial growers use a lot of fungicides on watermelon. It just, I just reminded myself, can I tell you a story from long ago? Sure. In the, in the trailer days of County Extension. Oh, I thought this was going to be Mazar Town and Chickens. No, no, not that long ago. This is from the trailer days when... Um, I worked as a secretary for the county extension office. I was Teresa once upon a time, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> and um, where their nursery is now, we had several portable units, you know, cobbled together that made our offices. Anyway, um, Jim Mall was the was the bill at that time. He was the horticulture agent, and he got. There's one gentleman who called on a weekly basis about various things. And um, he kept calling about ants on his watermelon. He was growing watermelon and he had ants all over them. And I believe also the ag agent, Stacy, you know, became involved of them trying to, you know, solve his problem of continual ants all over his watermelon, not fire ants, you know, just ants in and around. Finally, with talking to him, he confessed that he wanted to make his watermelons sweeter. So he put tiny little holes in them and infused them with sugar water. <laughs> <clears throat> What's your yeah, recommendation we, we on that? We don't recommend that one. That's, the, that's <laughs> not a best management practice, I don't believe. <laughs> <It's> not, <yes. laughs> Adding sugar to a product is not going to help it grow sweeter. I don't. It's, no, it's going no, to no, attract. no, that won't work. Yeah. Now, after you pick the watermelon, there are adult beverages that you could infuse the watermelon with, but that's a totally <laughs> different. That's a topic of a different class, I think. Yes. <laughs> now, Facebook user says they have seven types of beans popping up now planted just one and a half weeks ago. And that is absolutely perfect. The weather has been, other than a couple chilly nights, and keep in mind, if overnight in your yard it gets down to 50 or 45 or even 40, that's not damaging for yeah. vegetables. Maybe tropical vegetables and trop, you know, papayas and things are going to be unhappy when it gets that cold. But beans, they'll take it down to fairly cold. If we get a freeze, it's going to damage them, but... That's absolutely perfect. And right now is a perfect time of year to be getting them up and growing them. We, um, we've um we been having nights in the 40s the past few days, but no frosts. So yeah. and it doesn't last very long. In fact, it's nice. Uh, cools things down, I think. I think, but it's funny. You go out by nine and it's like 75 already, <laughs> you know. 
Yeah, and my tomato and pepper and eggplant um, and tomatilla, I'm trying tomatillas this year, transplants have been sitting outside and they've been loving the weather. It's been absolutely perfect for them. And speaking of such things, this is a good buildup. I think Brenda's um, questioning the sugar in the watermelon. <laughs> <laughs> Um, here's a good segue. March 10th, which is a Wednesday, 10 a.m., mm -hmm. Dr. Lester and I are going to have a class on incorporating edibles into your Florida-friendly landscape. So keep an eye out for that one. And what like I think is... Vegetables can be Florida-friendly? Sure. If you teach us how to uh, how to do it the right way and that we don't, I think that's kind of what um, we're going for is that you teach us right plant, right place, even when it comes to vegetables. What's mm -hmm. cool about that is that um, we're going to talk about tucking them into your existing landscape. So if you're less frustrated and you're, you plant the right plants at the right time, let alone in the right place, and then you'll be using less water, less chemicals, and that is how you have a Florida-friendly uh, edible <laughs> landscape. And productive also. Yes. Because and that's what you do with your vegetables, right? You don't have like a plot out there in the backyard. Your dogs would destroy it. You have them tucked into your landscape beds, don't you? Oh, no, I have a plot out in the backyard because we have the backyard divided. They have their part. Oh, okay. And we have the, the pool and the other part. And, yeah, I've, I've actually been out there with a shovel digging out the Bahia turf and making compost and going through all the steps to build a proper vegetable garden. I have some beautiful broccoli coming up right now. Cool. Well, but in general, you have tucked them into your landscape beds. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have to see proof of that uh, shoveling thing. Going to get, have to get Nora to get some pictures. <laughs> yeah, I didn't get a picture of that. But uh, <laughs> let me work on pull. I got a picture of the broccoli just the other day. Let me work on seeing so if I can show pull us. that up here. Okay. Oh, March 10th um, at 10 o'clock. I'm answering any of when our uh, classes, and you can get the Zoom link by going to my Facebook page, Hernando FFL Program. Check out my Facebook page. Check out Bill's Hernando Extension um, Facebook page. Check out BJ's Citrus County Extension Facebook page. They're coming up with a bunch of cool classes lately as well. Ryan. Osceola County and uh, Lake County. And I have noticed since the beginning of the year, a big resurgence in many county extension offices offering really cool classes. And this, one of the good things we can pull out of how the world is now is that we have access to all these classes online, no matter you know who's offering it. So you Instead of hearing the same thing from the same people all the time, you get all these different perspectives. And I like to listen while I work so I can steal, I mean, learn their ideas. And, you know, and it, it, we all help build each other up. So, you got that picture? Yeah, it just came through. Bill's uh, broccoli. Let's see. Need to give it a moment to load here because I got a bunch of pictures. Um, mm -hmm. So when do you think your broccoli will be available for um, harvest? Today. Really? <laughs> well, when you see in just a moment here. There you go. There's one. Yeah. Yeah. Nice, big, beautiful broccoli, perfect, and definitely ready to pick today. If you Before let it go it starts, a little bit too long, the it'll tiny start little, flowering, right? It'll flower, yeah. Yeah. So you have to kind of be patient and let it get to full size, but pick it before it's a little bit too late. 
And there's now, if it more. starts flowering, is it still edible if it starts flowering? Yep. It's still edible when it starts flowering. If it flowers, you can let it flower because bees and bumblebees absolutely love the flowers. And it'll make little um, seed pods on the plants. And you can eat those. That's really good in stir fry from what I've been told. Okay. I have red kale, which is done mm -hmm. just great all winter long. It loves the cold weather. I have Swiss chard growing in a container in a pot. So any kind of green leaf, kale, Swiss chard, any kind of lettuce, you can grow in a pot or a container. In the winter. In the winter. And I have, I believe this is peppermint. So I have mint that is actually growing because it seems like I've always killed mint in the past but I put it in a spot underneath some palm trees so it gets sun, but not an awful lot of sun during the day. And I'm being sure to keep it well watered because it, it likes it a little moist and mm -hmm. it's taken off. That's growing in a pot also. And this one, if it'll load. Interesting perspective you have with those photos. You can tell from your six, four frame that you're taking those <laughs> photos. There we go, purple sage, which is doing great. And I've already taken that a while back. I picked all the decent sized leaves off of it and dried it and ground it up. And I have my own dried homegrown purple sage in a little jar on the spice rack. You, I need to do it again. What do you use it on? Chicken, any mm -hmm. kind of poultry. Sage is essential for poultry or turkey. Sage is essential. That's true. I have a granddaughter named Sage, so I'm just going to go with that, <laughs> with that line. And I have no idea why, but if you go to a grocery store to buy Sage in the spice aisle, it is incredibly expensive for some reason now. I saw it like $4 for a little container. So I'm thinking, I'm going to grow my own. I'm not going to pay And how much for it. do you think overall it costs you to grow your Sage? Pennies. <laughs> I was given the plant. Okay. And it's growing in a either three gallon or five. I think three gallon pot. I probably need to put it in a bigger pot. And it has done very very well all winter long. It did not mind the cooler weather. I can. Um, I know someone who can check your water usage to see if <laughs> if that increased while you're growing your vegetables and <laughs> let you know about that. So sage is good with pork. That's true. Mm, I'm getting hungry now. I know. Somebody else harvested some broccoli. Broccoli is surprisingly easy to grow here in Central Florida. I've never <clears throat> had problems growing it. You have to grow it during the winter. So plant it in the fall. And you can start seeds in little pots and put the transplants in your garden. Every time I've tried growing it before, I've just gotten a bunch of broccoli. It's just really easy to grow. And most people don't think about it. So you're going to have chicken and sage and broccoli tonight. I don't know what we're having for. Well, I know I'm having broccoli with dinner tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, is this also um, the time that you would be harvesting cauliflower too? Yes. When the cauliflower makes the head and gets as big as it's going to get. And once again, you have to pick it at the right time. Otherwise, the head will get loose and try to start to flower also. And Annie has a dehydrator also, so she picks and dries all of her herbs. I've done it. I've grown a couple time, types of basil last fall, I think, and picked it and dried it in the dehydrator. I've grown um, Thai hot peppers. They're the little hot peppers that get red. I grew them, <clears throat> dried a whole bunch of them in a dehydrator, ground them, and I've got like two jars of that. So, wow. Now, what kind of jars do you use? You just recycle some of your glass jars that you have? or? Well, you can do that. You can save your empty herb containers. Or if you look on, on 
I hate to give a plug to Amazon, but we all buy stuff on Amazon. Everybody we does. On, we know. On the Amazon, we got, and it was pretty inexpensive, like 10, 15 bucks, a case with like 20 little glass herb jars with the screwed on cap mm. and a little plastic lid with little holes in it so that you could shake it out. So I just bought a bunch of jars because mm -hmm. I started, I thought I'm going to grow all my own herbs. I'm going to dry them and save them. And it's, it, you know, make sure there was an S on that word there, Dr. Lister. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit of effort, but it's worked out really well so far. I need to plan on planting more different things and dry them and save them. If Annie yeah, says glass jars, jars, I mean, if you have yeah, like, like jelly yeah. jars or something a little small, and you know, sure. the county is not able to recycle glass anymore because there's no market for it. That's a great way to reuse, you know, the glass jars that you do have. And if you have McCormick or whatever spices, those are wonderful jars. Mm -hmm. I also use those to put plant seeds in. Oh, yeah. We save them also. They come in very handy for either, you know, your own dried herbs or seeds or other little things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Annie says that you could dry dill. I have some dill growing in the backyard, but it's not really huge yet. It may get huge. We're getting near the end of dill season. Um, like I said, sage, I need to go out there and pick it and dry it, dry more. And rosemary, if you have a rosemary bush, I mean, they that's a perennial evergreen bush, basically. Great and to I've have it near your front door, too. Yeah, I've seen them get four feet tall. And that's a good one that you could tuck into your landscaping. Because if you put it by the front of your door and you live in a HOA subdivision, your neighbors are never going to complain about it. Well, I'm not, can't go quite that far. Sometimes you might have a neighbor that is going to complain about something, but they shouldn't complain about it because. And that will give you a great aroma yeah. at your front door and you can rub your hand on it and have that wonderful aroma on your hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've seen them there back again at the old extension office. They once had a rosemary bush that I swear was the size of a VW, VW bug. <laughs> thing was and they, that was the mother of all the rosemary that they sold in the nursery but yeah yeah i don't know what happened to it it's it's no longer i mean it was gone long before you came i guess it just had lived its life yeah it's long gone there are some plants on the property that have been there for a very long time mm -hmm. well i have a whole totally different subject if we have um, used up vegetables. <laughs> sure. What week is it, Dr. Lester? Oh, no, I don't know. I think it's February 25th. <laughs> Invasive, exotic, pest week. Yes, it is. And okay. we have that on Facebook also to mm -hmm. remind everybody. And I have a couple of uh, recorded classes on my Facebook. One I, I did a while ago called Seductive Invaders. If you want to watch that and the focus of that and why it has that name is because Dr. Lester and I all the time deal with people who are in love with um, these invasive exotic plants, don't want to give them up. Um, and so, as I always say, there's no such thing as a bad plant universe did not create a bad plant. The problem is almost all of the time created by the most invasive species of all. And here we are, <laughs> you know, so wrong plant, wrong place with no natural checks and balances causes a whole lot of ecological chaos. So I have classes kind of explaining that. And even, even if they have benefits, every plant has a benefit. Camphor is a fantastic you know medicinal value brazilian pepper beekeepers love it <laughs> lantana will attract butterflies but their bad size outweigh the good that they do mm -hmm. and i have a follow-up class on that to help you once you realize you're in a toxic relationship with your invasive <laughs> plant, that um 
how to make better choices. And it's called this, not that. And I just kind of pre-recorded that and put it up on Facebook. Um, that, and I concentrated on natives. It doesn't have to be natives, but in place of this invasive plant, why don't you try this native plant, which gives you a similar look or, or a similar attribute, but it's gonna be much, much, much better for the environment. So go check those out. So you branched out to giving classes on relationship advice? Yes, relationships with your plants, yes. Okay, okay. You're the doctor. I'm just kind of the counselor. I'm the plant <laughs> counselor. <laughs> so I guess we can add plant counseling to the services that we offer. Yes, how to get out. Oh, that's a good title. How to get out of a toxic relationship with your landscape. <laughs> Like, uh, That's a very good title and a very good subject. Because people are emo emotionally involved with their plants. Mm -hmm. As I just mentioned, you know, camphor trees, they, um, they're they huge. So it might be an expense to get rid of one. But also people love having those huge trees in their yard. As um, I mentioned in the classes, fast growing almost all of the time means weak in a storm. But what I hear... What I have heard over my years is maybe people move down to Florida to retire. They like the look of this nice big tree in their yard. And they tell me they don't have 40 years to wait for, you know, this one wonderful big tree. But do you want it falling on your house? You know, do you want all the babies that you're having to mow up all the time? Do you, camphor trees specifically have those purple berries that the birds help spread, but sometimes they want to help spread it on your driveway, walkway, car, with all those little purple surprises for you, <laughs> too. So, Yeah, and we have issues with people who move here from other states, and they still really, really want to grow rhododendrons or hollyhocks or apples. They're not invasive. Or They're just not going to grow. <laughs> and then they start insisting on Facebook, well, I found a variety of lavender that kind of sort of grows in the summer and they're, they're encouraging everybody else out there. Oh, I guess I can grow lavender in Central Florida also. It's not going to work really, really well. It's going to take a lot of work. And then you end up spending a lot of water and fertilizer and pesticides and we don't want to see that. So ending, let's see, what, what will be a good um, title for it? amicably ending a relationship with your northern plants <laughs> there you go it's something that you may loving them from afar loving them from afar because mm -hmm. you can order tulips online and you can plant tulips in your garden right here in hernando county and they'll probably come up and bloom this spring and they'll never come back again <laughs> because they will rot in the ground during the summer because we're just too wet and too hot and too steamy. And when we refer to invasive exotic uh, weeds, which I think they want us to change the terminology, but I don't remember um, <laughs> what the terminology is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. The focus is on um, that word exotic because we have many, many native plants here that people consider weeds. And I'm a weed lover, I'm a weed advocate. As long as it's, you know, they say, may all your weeds be wildflowers. As long as it's an ecologically um, sound plant that um, helps nature, I'm all for the weeds. It's the invasive exotics that disrupt our natural ecosystems that, you know, we have problems with. And it looks like Annie is embracing weeds as a ground cover now. That's great. That's that's so much easier and you spend so much less time, less money. You're not out there at the lawn and garden center buying bags of stuff and putting it on your lawn. It's A so lot. much better for the environment. All those pollinators have stuff in your mm -hmm. lawn then that they can go to, you know, not just a monoculture of turf, which is only turf is only really going to attract a few beetles, <laughs> really, you know, grubs. So exactly. I'll try to remember to go out there and shoot some video of what I have growing in my lawn to show what it looks like and also kind of, you know, let 
people, and I'm not going to say that it looks great. I mean, it does not look like a well manicured, perfect St. Augustine lawn. But to get to that point, and I know that we're starting to get all the phone calls and emails at the office about weeds. Ah, oh, what do I do to get rid of this weed and that weed? Even herbicides that are labeled to be used in either St. Augustine grass or Bahia grass don't work perfectly. None of them are a silver bullet where you go out there and you put it in your yard and boom, in a week, the weeds are gone. Your lawn looks perfect. It's a battle and you can get rid of some of the weeds, but I rarely see people get rid of all the weeds and have them. And they shouldn't. And they shouldn't because it's actually healthier for your turf. To have that diversity in the diversity in science is always leads to better health. It just does, you yeah. know. It turns into a never ending battle that most people don't win. You just end up having to keep fighting it and spending more money, spending more time, more energy. So, like I said, spring means questions about weeds, questions. Questions about bugs, they're they're just about to start rolling in next, I guess. So lots it, of it, Deb mentioned lilacs. People want to try to grow lilacs here. But I yeah. always um, <laughs> tell people, I mean, I love lilacs. Nothing on earth smells better <laughs> than a lilac. <laughs> but if you think about it, we had that beautiful aroma, or they do up north for what, two weeks? Yeah. <laughs> and then the rest of the time that bush just looks like me. <laughs> that was so there are good and bad things about everything. We've got all kind of lovely plants here. As well. And Annie asked about, she's looking for perennial peanut for her lawn and it's hard to find. Go ahead and try looking online for that. I mean, there are so many opportunities for buying seeds and plants and different things online now. I know that there are two different types of perennial peanuts. There's the annual and the rhizome one. And you, University of Florida has some really good um, fact sheets on perennial peanuts so that you can read about it and decide you want one or the other. And if you look online, you should be able to find it. You should be able to I've find it. I've heard it's been fire. in the big box stores under EcoTurf. Whether or not they're still providing it, I'm not sure. Yeah, they are. And you got to make sure you have a lot of space. If, if you get the rhizome one, make sure you have a lot of space for it to grow. I heard complaints from someone was very um, disillusioned that he wasn't told <laughs> that this rhizomal um, perennial peanut would become fairly aggressive. Yeah. So. And that just comes down to right plant in the right place. If you want it for a residential yard, the rhizome one is probably going to end up shooting into your neighbor's yard and making them unhappy. If mm -hmm. you have 20 acres out in the middle of the country, you got room, <laughs> you know, if you're raising horses yeah. or cattle or something. And be careful if you want it as an entire lawn, you know, think about that as well, because it does. Um, well, so does most turf, but it freezes and turns brown this time of year. So think about if that's something that you want as well. Um, Did you see that one about the orange pod from Toby? Yes, Toby has a weird looking weed that has the bright orange pods that crawl everywhere. We need a picture. <laughs> yes. I'm not really sure off the top of my head. And there are so many different plants that could potentially be growing either in your flower bed or your lawn or pasture. Or where are you, Toby? Yeah. Um, if you're in if South we, Florida. Yeah, even if we start looking through a weed book there are just so many different things that could be growing there send, show your email so they can send a picture i'll do that if you want to email me a picture of a weed at wlester at ufl.edu uh we will either look I, I will either know what it is off the top of my head or i can look it up and figure out what it is or if it's a little trickier I send it to the University of Florida Herbarium because Mark Frank up there is great to work with. He always knows what it is and will promptly email me back exactly what it is. Just so take a really good picture. 
<laughs> Take a oh, really no. good picture or Dr. Lester will hear about it from said Mark Frank. <laughs> yes, if I send him bad pictures, I get yelled at through email. So, <laughs> But, uh, but um, that's the great thing about um, any extension office in any county, you know, depending on exactly where you live in Florida. We all work together. We all work mm -hmm. with all the researchers and all the resources up there at the University of Florida in Gainesville. And if we don't know what it is, somebody up there definitely does. So we just share it with them. And they usually get right back with us very quickly with uh, identification, an answer, a control recommendation, whatever it is that you're looking for. That's what's the great part of working um, how we do. We're surrounded by really smart people. And somebody exactly. knows. Like yes. And it makes Dad, us look good. <laughs> yeah. Dad, who mentioned the uh, lilacs that don't grow well here in Florida, is Ohio born and grown. So lilacs probably do just great up there. Oh, yeah. I grew up in Maryland and we had rhododendrons. What else do we have? We had crab apples. Uh, we had. What are the bushes that get the yellow flowers very, very, very early in the spring? There might even still be snow on the ground. Witch hazel is well, like, well, the first thing that comes up. I'm not sure. Yeah. You're, now, and now you're like the people who call you, what's the bush with yellow flowers? <laughs> what's that bush with yellow flowers? <laughs> pussy willow is one of the first things that comes up up north. Oh, yeah. 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 Pussy willows, too. Mm hmm. Yep. Because I think Pussy Willow is in the witch hazel family, and that's like one of the first things that comes even so. through the snow. So Diana has right. a plethora Leather. of shamrocks, the oxalis, in her lawn. They're green. She just leaves them alone. Great. I'm so glad that we're hearing those kind of comments today, as opposed to what do I spray to get rid of all my weeds? Because it's a tough question. I mean, there are things that you could spray and they there, will there. help you control them, but there are no silver bullets out there in a spray bottle. There are two things that two terms we've learned that we've picked up from others to describe the kind of lawns that we have is either a diverse lawn area for <laughs> Cynthia. That's it. That is it. It was a Cynthia <laughs> bush and it was beautiful early in the spring. There might even still be snow on the ground with uh yellow flowers on it yes for scythias will not do well here in central <laughs> florida <laughs> um diverse lawn area and freedom lawns those are the two terms <laughs> that um we use to describe our lawns which are green mowable and look good it's at 30 miles an hour as you drive by but the other thing that they are is they are living lawns i mean all sorts of wonderful things are living in them. It's just so much better. Peonies, yes. <laughs> this is going to be a list of uh, all the things we can't grow here. <laughs> <laughs> Daffodils. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Gosh, we could make multiple classes on things that will not do well here in Central Florida. But, of course, then we're going to have to provide the alternatives of what will. Because, yeah. you know, Florida... In the name, <laughs> we can grow plants here. And then you always get somebody who insists, well, I can grow one. I have a forsythia that's not completely dead. <laughs> yes. Um, and there are exceptions to every rule. So whenever we talk about plants and insects, there's always, with living things, it seems like there's always some exception to it. They, yeah, I've, they don't read the books. I've gotten pictures from people in Spring Hill with big, beautiful mango trees that had a bunch of mangoes on them so it is possible but it is really really difficult so don't go starting a, a mango grove business here in hernando county thinking you're going to be a millionaire because it's going to be really really difficult so there are an, is an exception to every rule and thanks for helping with those northern plants because neither uh, Bill nor I owned our own property when we lived up north. <laughs> I was 11 when I came here. You were what, 18 or something? 18, yeah. Yeah. So we're 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 stretching back to our 
childhood times to remember these wonderful flowers up there. So if you guys have any other questions, go ahead and feel free to go ahead and post them in the chat. Um, let me go ahead and start showing our contact information. Let's start with my nice, short, easy to remember email address. If you have any other questions, pictures, weeds, whatever, like I said, feel free to send them. Or if you live in another county, feel free to contact your county's extension office also. I know mm -hmm. that we have BJ on here earlier. I'm not sure if she's still here or not. She's the county extension director with Citrus County Extension. And we are all open and open for business and ready to help. And there's Lily's long and hard to remember email address. It's a good thing I have a short, I mean, what if it was Browning? What if it was L Browning? Then it would be, even... it could, be long, could be worse. Yes, it could be worse. <laughs> and that Lily D wanna... actually has a meaning, you know, as compared to other county workers who, like Karen's is K Mojica mm -hmm. um, from Mosquito Control. Those of us with our first name and last initial, that means we have been county workers since before 2000. Ooh. So it's either like a badge of honor or, um, you know, some kind of... <laughs> <laughs> We refuse to give those up because it says we have been here a long time. <laughs> so. You're one of the special ones. Yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes. Stockholm and, Syndrome, but you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. There is our office number also, 352-754-4433. If you want to call, I'm sure you will get a hold of Teresa, and she's more than happy to answer your questions or direct you to where you can get an answer. Yeah, let me go back fantastic. and check any last minute comments here. Yes. I guess Diana is going to be in our class this evening. Yes, she is. So yes, she'll she be is. online all day, like I will be, uh, all day, and like you will be too. So, uh, yes, the class we're holding this evening is a rain barrel and compost um, workshop. It's filled up, it's getting a you know, bit late to. <laughs> participate in that but we hold them every month every other month kind of somewhere in there so keep your eye on when the next one will be we haven't even discussed when the next one will be but um maybe beginning of april something like that we'll have another one and you attend the workshop with us on zoom in the evening and then the following saturday you go to the master gardener nursery to pick up your items and hopefully pick up some wonderful plants at the Master Gardener Nursery as well. Because it is spring and it's time to start loading up on plants to replace the ones that froze and died this past winter. And make sure you get ones that are probably not going to die this coming winter. Yeah. And our nursery has plants that are all either native or Florida friendly and appropriate for this area. So if they do get frozen back a little bit, like firebush and a lot of other plants will get freeze damaged, but they rarely die. And normally if you just prune them up really well in the middle of March, they're gonna grow right back and do just fine. Mm -hmm. And we do not carry forsythias at the nursery in case anybody was wondering. That's so sad. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have cassia, don't you? Um, nice yellow flowers. They do, but I'm not sure exactly what variety of cassia they carry. Hopefully not, not the invasive kind. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple different varieties of cassia. Um, isn't there one like the Bahamas cassia or something? One from the Caribbean? Oh, well, there's a native one, though, too. Yeah, yeah, there is a native yeah. one. There's all so, kind of pretty, pretty flowers there. And in the next month or two, when you go to the nursery, things will actually be blooming and look even better. So, okay. And the website that's scrolling at the very bottom here, hernandoextension.com. If you go there, 
that's a full list of all of our upcoming classes and whether they're going to be here on uh, StreamYard or on Facebook or on Zoom or however we're doing them, all the information and links you're going to need are going to be right there. Uh, are you putting this on a podcast? Yes. All of these episodes are recorded and they go onto YouTube and they are also on a, on a number of different podcast sites. So if you look up the virtual plant clinic with Dr. Check Bill, it uh, whatever pods uh, cast site that you normally make use of, it's probably on there. And Oh, I didn't know that, Bill. I didn't know you were flinging me all over the world. <laughs> Yeah, we're we're te I'm, this technically listed on like a half a dozen different podcast sites. Fantastic. And in just a little bit here, when I have a little bit of free time today, I'll you know download the audio from this episode and upload it to the podcast page. Sleep is overrated. You don't need to sleep tonight. <laughs> See, you can listen to us while you're driving in the car, or maybe when you're at work. And let's double check those comments one more time. And little Cadella, you are very welcome. Just keep tuning in and keep asking us questions. And Brenda, thanks again for tuning yep. in. Brenda listens from work. Yes, she does. And Diana's Gloxinia is coming back very well. They can grow well here. They're going to get, they mm -hmm. die back quite a bit sometimes during the winter depending on if you leave them in a pot outdoors or in the ground outdoors or if you have them in a pot and you bring them in but gloxinius can do okay and annie thank you so much we will see you again next week also so i guess with that we will go ahead and wrap it up for today and okay, thank you yep. everybody we'll see you here again next thursday I will see you, Bill. I will see you at six o'clock tonight. Yes. I'll see you again today. Yes.